Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today, my quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture brings us to the year 2017. The first of a four-year stretch that I'm sure many of us would rather forget, but never mind that now, we had enough politics in the last episode. Today's topic is the first and so far only animated movie to win Worst Picture, The Emoji Movie. This is the brainchild of director Tony Leondis, whose only prior directorial credit on the big screen is 2008's Igor, which I somehow never heard of until now. Maybe it's good, I don't know. Leondis was a fan of Toy Story, which featured a formula we've seen Disney replicate several times with great success. Toys with feelings, video games with feelings, cars with feelings, feelings with feelings. Leondis decided to offer his take on the concept, emojis with feelings. This is a bit different from Inside Out, as the characters in that movie were the personification of human emotions, while emojis are the personification of... wait a minute. Somehow there was a bidding war for this film, which Sony won, and they put the movie into production and released it within two years, which is very fast for a feature-length animated film. And if you're thinking that's a bad sign, you're right! The movie centers on Jean, a meh emoji voiced by T.J. Miller, another bad sign, who lives in an app on some teenager's phone called Textopolis, because they couldn't legally call it iMessage. And he's joined by a cast of other emojis, including High Five, voiced by James Corden, enough of the bad signs already, Smiler, voiced by Maya Rudolph, Jean's parents, Stephen Wright and Jennifer Coolidge, also meh emojis. And in the case of Stephen Wright, that's actually perfect casting. And Poop, voiced by Sir Patrick Stewart. Yes. Poop is actually a character in this movie. And the fact that they wasted someone as talented as Stewart in this role is just depressing. I mean, Miller and Corden? Yeah, they're right where they belong. Stewart? Why? Initially, Jordan Peele was offered the role, which he said led to his decision to quit acting, and honestly, I can't say I blame him. But he did release Get Out that same year, and continues to have a successful career behind the camera, so... silver lining. In addition to the rushed production, the movie also had a weird-as-hell marketing campaign, which included Miller parasailing into Cannes the day before the film festival for... reasons. They also posted some bizarre, emoji-fied references to other media on Twitter, starting with this Game of Thrones parody... This is supposed to be a kid's movie, right? And following that up five days later with this even more bizarre and tasteless reference to The Handmaid's Tale, which was deleted two days later after a huge backlash that anyone with two brain cells to rub together could have seen coming. Shockingly, they did not post any more parodies on Twitter after that. I can only imagine what else they might have had in the pipeline. 12 years in emoji? The girl with the emoji tattoo? 13 emojis? Why? Fuck it! How dark can we make this? The plot of the Emoji movie is kind of lame, but let's go over it anyway. Jean is trying to join the Emoji workforce as a meh emoji, following in the footsteps of his parents. But they're not really in favor of the idea because Jean isn't very good at just being meh. He has a wide range of emotions and wants to be able to express himself freely. Here's the thing I don't get. How can he not go to work as an emoji? He is an emoji. Where else is he supposed to work? Jeffy Lube? And another thing I don't get, Gene isn't just known as meh, he has an actual name. So do his parents, Mel and Mary. But none of the other emojis have names. They aren't Janet Smiler or Chris High Five or Cornelius Archibald Poop the Third or whatever the hell. Why doesn't anyone other than the meh family have actual names? And I can already tell I'm putting way more thought into this than the writers did, so let's just move on. On his first day on the job, the teenage owner of the phone tries to send Gene as a reply to his love interest, but Gene panics at the last second and gets sent as... someone trying and failing to hold in a sneeze? I don't know. Oh, shut it down! Of course he gets cut off before he can actually say shit. Nevertheless, I must ask again, this is a kid's movie, right? The head of the emoji department, Smiler, declares Jean is a malfunction and must be deleted. And she sicks her army of death bots on him. But he's rescued by High Five, a once popular emoji who has since fallen out of favor, and he agrees to help Jean find a hacker who can reprogram him so he can be the meh he needs to be. So it's time to leave Textopolis and jump to a bunch of different apps that they did get the rights for. This leads to several advertisements, I mean name drops, including Facebook, Dropbox, Spotify, Candy Crush, and WeChat of all things. I guess that's there for the Chinese market? They enter the piracy app, which is disguised as the dictionary so the kid's parents can't find it. Somehow, Gene is confused by this. What could a teenage boy possibly want to hide from his parents? Ladies and gentlemen, the movie's one funny line. 
After doing their best to avoid some bad jokes about internet trolls and spam, they find a hacker emoji known as Jailbreak, played by Anna Faris. I would add her to the list of people too good for this movie, but she has The Hot Chick, Movie 43, and three Alvin and the Chipmunks movies on her resume, so nah. Jailbreak reluctantly agrees to help them, and after a series of what can generously be called comedic events, they make their way to a firewall that sits between them and the cloud, where Jailbreak can find Gene's source code and reprogram him as a meh. Since the firewall operates on face recognition, Jailbreak thinks, correctly it turns out, that Gene can unlock it as he is somehow capable of different facial expressions. Of course, most of the emojis in this movie are capable of different facial expressions, including Jailbreak herself, so... I'm really not clear on why she needs Jean specifically. I know the movie was rushed, but my god, how did nobody catch that obvious plot hole? You're thinking, because I can make different faces, the firewall will think I'm different emojis. Yeah, I wanted to say it because it was my idea. You know, women are always coming up with stuff that men are taking credit for. I mean, yeah, that is unfortunately very true, but that's not what he did. Not even close. So here's the thing about the Jailbreak character. She's not actually a hacker emoji. Once upon a time, she was a princess emoji, but she got tired of being stereotyped and fled Textopolis and tried to escape into the cloud but got locked out by the firewall. She's here to give the movie a feminist perspective, which would be fine if the filmmakers took the time to properly flesh out their message. Thanks to the rushed production schedule, that was time they did not have. The result is a message that's little more than empty platitudes. Calling it half-assed would be generous. It's quarter-assed at best. There's a scene where Jailbreak complains that a woman emoji can only be a princess or a bride, and that's not enough for her. And I would get that if we hadn't seen other female emojis in the movie who were neither princess nor bride. Like Smiler. You know, the movie's main villain. I understand the point they're trying to make, but boy howdy are they going about it all wrong. And all of this is pointless because by the end of the movie, she's apparently cool with being a princess again. So conforming is good, actually? Except, no, 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 that doesn't track, because getting back to Gene's story... After Gene gets them through the firewall and into the cloud, he ultimately does suppress his emotions and becomes an official meh. But Smiler is still going to delete Gene anyway because, well, look at that face, she's clearly insane. But Gene's father isn't about to take this lying down, and surprise, he has the same malfunction as Gene. And if Smiler is going to delete Gene, she'll have to delete him too. Smiler agrees to do so without a moment's hesitation. Well, that was pointless. Oh, I did not see that one coming. Really? You didn't see that one coming? Well, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say you are the only one. I mean, what was your plan here? What leverage did you think you had over her? She has an army of death bots. You have a comb over. Just how did this scenario play out in your head? I'm curious. However, it turns out everyone is at risk of deletion as Gene's earlier panic attack caused the phone's owner to assume there must be something wrong with it, and he takes it to the non-trademark violating phone store so they can reset it. Just before the phone is wiped clean, and with some encouragement from his family and friends, Gene realizes his emotions are what make him who he is and shouldn't be repressed. So he pulls out all the stops and helps the kid send a message to his crush to properly express how he feels. And it works, so he decides to keep the phone as is and everyone is saved. So when Jailbreak conforms, it's good, but when Gene doesn't conform, it's also good? What the hell is the message here? In the depths of your ignorance, what are you trying to say? No wonder this movie made Jordan Peele want to quit acting. It's a mess. In addition to Worst Picture, it took home Worst Director, Worst Screenplay, and Worst Screen Combo for any two obnoxious emojis. And that last award sounds about as lazy as this movie's screenplay. Its only saving grace is its shorts, running just under 90 minutes, and considering the short production schedule, I'm amazed it's as long as it is. The animation is adequate, but nothing special. Same goes for the voice acting, which probably would have been better with some actual voice actors. But again, Stephen Wright was a good call. The story was about as well thought out as Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter. The message is confusing. The product placement is borderline obscene. It violates the rule of not referring to a better movie during your own. We'll always have Paris, Mary. I wish I was watching Casablanca instead of this shit. And considering this is supposed to be for kids, several of the jokes are not age appropriate. Why is the eggplant emoji in the movie? You do know what the eggplant emoji is used for, right? I'll give you a hint, it doesn't mean they want to make Ratatouille. I wish I was watching Ratatouille instead of this shit. 
When I first saw this movie, I thought the lead character was rather appropriate considering my initial reaction was... meh. But the more I think about it, the less I like it. Now I'm leaning less towards meh and more towards... yeah. That said, it's not the worst movie of 2017, and I wouldn't be surprised if it won purely for the novelty of being the first animated movie to win. At the time, I thought Fifty Shades Darker should have won Worst Picture, but I later changed my mind after seeing the clusterfuck that was The Snowman, and nearly five years later, I stand by that. That was the worst movie of 2017, and I do not understand how it didn't even get a nomination. If you don't know the story, basically the studio didn't give them enough filming time. This made telling the story they wanted to tell virtually impossible, as very important chunks of the story were never shot. Two very talented editors, Claire Simpson and Thelma Schoonmaker, who have four Oscars between them, were brought in to try to salvage the film, but even they couldn't save the snowman from being an incomprehensible shit -valanche. I am still amazed this movie was released in the state it was in. Warner Brothers is shelving fully completed films for tax write-offs that the public may never get to see, and Universal gave The Snowman a theatrical release. Go figure. And it is ridiculous that The Snowman did not get a single Razzie nomination in any category. The movies they did nominate for Worst Picture, The Mummy, Transformers The Last Night, Baywatch, and the aforementioned Fifty Shades Darker and the Emoji Movie were at least finished movies. The Snowman was not. So this is another swing and a miss for the Razzies. And so was their choice to give Worst Actor to Tom Cruise for The Mummy. That movie wasn't great, but Tom's acting wasn't the problem. And remember the previous year's Barry L. Bumstead Award for a movie that cost a lot and lost a lot? Well, this year they gave it to Chips, but redefined the award as a movie that would have been nominated for Worst Picture had its theatrical run met their eligibility criteria. I don't know what that means, and I don't care enough to find out. They also introduced a category in partnership with Rotten Tomatoes that allowed their readers to vote for a Worst Picture nominee that they thought was unfairly nominated. The movie so rotten, you loved it. Baywatch won the award. I have no idea who all these people are that loved Baywatch, but there it is. And while he didn't appear at the award ceremony in person, Dwayne Johnson accepted the award by video. We made Baywatch with the best of intentions. It didn't work out like that, but I hum I humbly and graciously accept my Razzie. Uh, movie so rotten you eventually fell in love with it. That's just the way love goes. I am not at all surprised he was a good sport about this. I mean, what does he have to feel bad about? If you're The Rock and you make a bad movie, you're still The Rock. But anyway, final thoughts on the Emoji movie. I've seen worse, but it's still crap. It's little more than a cheap attempt at cashing in on a trend, and it worked. It made over four times its production budget, so I understand why Sony went for it. I don't like it, but I get it. But you don't need to waste your time with this. There are much better options out there. Do you want colorful characters running amok on the internet? Here you go. Do you want a metaphor for adolescent anxiety? Got you covered. Do you want a story about the power of creativity and free expression? Done and done. The Emoji Movie tries to be all of these things and fails, and it doesn't even have the good sense to be entertaining in the process. Not worth your time. Next time, we'll be talking about a collaboration between Will Ferrell and John C. Riley. The bad one. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood... Not Ratatouille. I'm a bit of a celebrity here. Always welcome. Ow! Loser!